Welcome to Community Church, and thanks so much for tuning in online. We hope that you enjoy today's message and are encouraged through your time here today. No matter who you are or what's going on in your life, know that we are so glad you're here. My name is Michael. I'm senior pastor here at Community Church, and uh, we are excited. We're excited about uh, what God's doing um, the days ahead. And in fact, uh, we really do hope that you know that uh, we, we believe uh, so much in God changing people that they would begin to live fully alive. That's why you keep hearing us talk about inviting and bringing, and uh, we pray you that you know that the, the reason behind it, we know people come to community church sometimes for months, and this might be uh, somebody who's listening right now, it might be your story. You've come for months, and it wasn't until after a period of time you decided to really open your heart and give your life to following Jesus' plan, but once you did, you've seen him work in your life, and you've begun to live more fully alive, and we want that. We want that for our friends. We want that for our communities around Hampton Roads and beyond, and so we just encourage you again, be a bringer. We believe God's going to do something absolutely amazing Easter, and uh, then again, starting that new message series, Chasing Tumbleweeds, and uh, yeah, we're going to have some fun. But this weekend's exciting uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, Specifically, uh, we're going to lose our minds with excitement here in a moment because, hey, Suffolk campus, we're, we're, we're pumped because today as that campus, we celebrate one year, our one year anniversary. So come on, Western Branch. Stuff at campus, so exciting what God has done in the last year, literally seeing hundreds of people impacted, you know, taking that step to go start a new campus in a new area, and uh, we know we're just getting started. The best is yet to come, and so we're pumped up about that, and uh, can't wait to see all God does in the days ahead. Well, I wouldn't consider myself, um, I wouldn't really call myself much of a movie goer. Uh, In fact, I think I've been to probably three or four movies or so in the last nine years. And uh, that's because primarily I have a lot of small kids and I've learned people frown on you when you bring your one-year-old into the movie theater. And uh, maybe maybe you've been that person frowning on others bringing their one-year-old into the movie theater. But just know the truth is they really wanted to watch the movie and they couldn't find a babysitter. And so they decided to go. So anyway, um, I recently took um, my kids to see this, this movie called The Greatest Showman. And it's not a, this isn't a, a, a promotion or anything like that for a movie. This is just some statements of fact. Uh, we went to go see this movie called The Greatest Showman. And since we went to see that movie, uh, every time we get in the car, my kids go, can we listen to the soundtrack of The Greatest Showman? And so then every time we're in the car, it feels like, or felt like for a period of time, we were listening to, this is the greatest show. And you know, I just tried to ruin it for some of you so you won't have to go through it. Uh, you know, like, like I did. But here's, here's what happened is this music, it was all great, but um, we listened to it so much. I listened to it so much. I'm like, I'm starting to hate it. <laughs> and, and you know what I'm talking about? It is something real good, but you just, all the time, all the, I'm about to give you what's called the, the, the biggest Jesus juke possible. The, this, this today, it's called Palm Sunday. It's the week, it's the beginning of the final week of Jesus' ministry, active ministry on earth. And then we we, we follow today on into next Sunday where we, uh, in in the church calendar, if you will, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, Easter Sunday. And as Christians, if you've been a Christian for very much time, one of the things that can happen is this can just become uh, something that we hear over and over and you're like, every year, yeah, I go to church on Palm Sunday and I went there and they talked about how, yeah, Jesus loves me and and he has died for my sins and then he went into a tomb and, and he rose from the grave. Do you want ketchup with your fries? And it's just this thing. And we miss the power We miss the practical. We miss the life change that God intends for us, that this isn't just a annual time of year where we take a little bit more time to understand who Jesus is and what he has done for us, but 2018 is a specific year and a specific moment in each of our lives when God wants to speak something to our hearts and wants to allow us to be changed so that we would all begin to live more fully alive, so that we would cause our neighbors and our friends and our family members to see something in us changed by God that they would then desire. That's the significance of this moment. 
And our prayer today is that every single one of us with hearts open would be ready for God to, maybe if you've heard some of the concepts we'll talk about today before, to share something new. Maybe some of you, you're just checking church out or this Jesus thing for the first time ever. It's all gonna be brand new. No matter where you're at, our hope and our prayer is that God would be the ultimate one who speaks to our heart and who changes us. So would you pray with me as we get ready to start our message? Lord, I love you and I thank you so much for your grace and your forgiveness I thank you that there is not a single person here today on accident, but that you have a plan for every one of us. And I thank you for the promise of your word that we know it's good. So I ask you right now, Jesus, that you would take my words, Lord, that you would breathe on them in such a way that you'd cause each person here not to simply hear what I have to say, but God, it would be just what you desire each of us individually to hear, to be changed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're going to do today is we're going to we're going to we're going to kind of go through a, through this story, but we're going to do it uh, really starting with the preparation of Palm Sunday, and then we're going to skip a whole bunch of parts because otherwise the message would last seven to eight hours, and uh, only three of you would stay, and that's because I pay you. And so then we're going to go then we're going to go uh, <laughs> that's just the truth, and then we're going to go and you wouldn't like it, and then we're going to get um, to what Jesus did on the cross. And we're going to discover, uh, I, I pray, some significance that, that often maybe we've overlooked. We're going to start in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says this, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. Now, Palm Sunday, where it gets that name, is that Jesus rode into Jerusalem as, as a savior, though many people didn't recognize that's what was happening. He rides into Jerusalem on a young colt. People are, are throwing down blankets. They're waving palm branches. They're, de they're declaring, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And they're, they're doing this. It's a procession, if you will, and it's happening. But before that takes place, we find Mark chapter 11. And we could just skim over this passage of scripture. There's nothing in and of itself that is like, man, that, that's a, just a great, great Bible verse. Like, you know, we, we, we share good, what I call Bible verses that if you memorize them, they'll just be really strength to you. Like Jeremiah 29, 11, maybe one of the most common, if you will, it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. And like, that's a good tattoo verse, you might say, or, or that's a good refrigerator verse, you might say. Mark chapter 11, verse one through three, you're like, I don't necessarily want to get tattooed on my arm. Go untie the colt, the Lord needs it. That just helps remind me, right? However, we learn some things about Jesus in these three verses that were true 2,000 years ago, and because the Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we know they're true today also. Primarily, it jumps out at, at me in this passage of Scripture as we get started, and that is that, that God has always been, Jesus has always been a relational God who desires to partner with humanity to fulfill his purpose. He's God. He did not need someone to go get him a colt. He did not need someone to go get him this donkey. He could have just been like, yo, poof, donkey. <laughs> but he didn't. He didn't. There's a lot he teaches us in this passage, and this is where we're going to start and, and, and I hope uh, learn a little bit, grow a little bit in what he has to say to us. It says he sent two people. Why? Well, because even as we learned last week, being a follower of Jesus has never been about going out on your own. You study the scriptures, the, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you find is God sends people in partnerships, in togetherness, to fulfill and to serve his purpose. He sends two of his disciples out to go. There's a whole lot in this too that I still struggle with, if I'm real honest, because while I, I love this passage, 
there's a lot I just don't understand. Because the awkwardness for these two dudes to just go up to somebody and be like, yo, could I borrow your colt? Could I just take it? I'll probably bring it back. I don't, under, I don't understand. It reminds me that so often, being a person who desires to live by faith in Jesus, he will call us and cause us to do things that often don't make sense, and guess what? Often, sometimes seem unnecessary, yet they're part of his bigger plan for us. He says, go, go untie this. It says that this colt had never been ridden on. Now, I don't really know much about farming or animals or anything, so I do research. His premise here is that this animal had not been broken in. This animal had not been tamed. There is no way uh, just in, in, if, if Michael was like, okay, I'll just hop on this donkey and we'll just ride, like that would not work. Yet Jesus is showing us something right here. I don't need you or things to be tamed and brought together to come to me. You can come in your out of control mess and I'm the one who can actually help you and strengthen you and put you on the right purpose and the right plan. No other humans can do that. That's what, that's what he does. So he says, bring me a colt that no one has ever ridden. But then he says, I'm going to give it back to you, which again just shows God's goodness to us today. Because I'm giving something I'm, I'm, I'm releasing something. This guy who owns this cult, he is releasing it. He is giving it to God. And yet, the promise of Scripture, if, if you don't know this, when it comes to both, or if it comes to our time, if it comes to our money, whatever it is, when we give to God, he makes these promises like he will give back to us only better. And we see it right here in action with this animal where it was given for God's purpose, untamed, unbroken in, wild and not that useful, and God brings it back better than he received it. Every time you and I find ourselves sacrificing or giving of ourselves or of our things or whatever the case may be for God's purposes, it's not because he's trying to take something from us. It's because he wants to elevate our purpose yes, Lord. by allowing him to be truly at work in it. And in order for this to happen, in order for the, the, the prep on De Palm uh, Sunday to happen, in order for you and I to, to be fully stepped into, if you will, God's purpose and plan for our life, there always has to be this element of what we would just call untying. Untying, it takes a step of faith. And again, it's like it doesn't make sense. Here's the way I, you know, I'll just be honest. If I feel in my heart sometimes that like we're supposed to do something or God wants me to do something, it, maybe sometimes I'm just like, well, Lord, you could just do something supernatural or just, you're God, just make it work. Or if you're like me and you've ever had the, this thought, that doesn't make sense, God. And it, it reminds me so much of like my kids because I, again, it doesn't matter if you have kids, if you can hear me right now, you once were a kid, so we're all in the same boat, right? What, what I know is that often my, uh, well, we could go down the list, but, but, but my six-year-old or my eight-year-old or whatever the case may be, like, they legitimately think they know more than I do. I mean, if you ever want help in your humility, have a seven-year-old look you in the eye and be like, no, I am smarter than you. <laughs> you're not. Like, I don't care what anyone is, you're, you're not. <laughs> Yet, I, I stand up here as a 37-year-old who, if I'm to be real honest, 
There's a chance I sometimes, and I'm not saying this is true for any of you, but just letting you know my own problems, and you can decide if you have these same problems. I might have a thought, I might make a decision, I might act a certain way where really I'm acting like I know more than God. Because I want it to make sense to me. And before he ever even begins the process of what we know as Holy Week, as Passion Week, where we could just check right through, he does this extreme measure which makes no sense and just seems really small, but he never rides into town on a donkey if he doesn't have two guys that just go untie a donkey and say, hey, God needs this. I'm going to bring it back. What, what, do you, what do you need to untie? What's God calling you in faith to do. I love this passage of scripture because for the last several years it actually has become kind of a, a lifeblood for me, helps me make, gives me a filter of decision making to do things maybe that I believe God said, but maybe they don't make sense. For inst- here's a for instance for you. Uh, a few years ago, um, a couple years ago at our Western Branch campus, um, we, we, we paved a little bit more of the parking lot. Now, understand something. Pavement is not sexy. <laughs> People aren't like, I'm so excited to go to that church because they just got some more pavement. <laughs> Do you want to go to community? Yes, I heard they got more pavement. Yet it costs tons of money. And I felt like this was an untying example for us as a church. Now, why would that be the case? Well, because it doesn't make sense to a whole lot of people. Yet what we know is now, because we did that, people, you could go this way. We, we know and we have watched and experienced it. And, and it could be with dad, but, but parents, single moms who have walked in, sometimes wearing heels in a gravel parking lot. Let me say something to you right now. I don't wear heels, so I can't necessarily exactly relate how difficult it would. I did put some on once when I was a kid, but that's not the case anymore today. And in fact, I don't, just throw that, I said that, just throw that thought out of your mind. I want you to focus in because sometimes what I do is I just get focused on me right now. Forget that image for a moment. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. A person comes in and it's a difficult experience for them to get in the door because of that experience. And it's, they're distracted and it was frustrating. And simply by doing this act, what we've done is we've removed a barrier for people that they would have had up a frustration or a distraction before they came in to experience God's love for them. And now we remove that. And as a result, both men, women, and kids have now experienced God's love distraction free when they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. See, this is why Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but we have story and testimony about how God works. This is how he works. So Jesus rides into town on an animal that says peace. This doesn't make sense to many people, probably half. Half understood because it, it was the case that a king, a leader would sometimes ride in on an animal like this. At the same time, people were ready for, for Jesus, the Savior, to come and just, just demolish the problems and make everything good. How many of you know that's often how we just like life to work? Let's just, let's just, whoosh, right? Jesus instead rides in, he does this, and he's like, I'm not ready to just do it all right now. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the house for a bit. And I hope you'll read your Bible and you'll see what led us to the final part of our message. Because Jesus goes to a cross. And on the cross, he makes what are referred to as seven final statements. And why I think it's significant for us to think about this today, why I hope this week leading into Easter will not just be a week where we go through the motion, but will be a week where we really dive in, is, is people often say that what you say when you're closest to death reveals what is in the deepest places of your soul. And so we find Jesus 
on the cross making some statements, and they're statements that I believe aren't things we should just look at and skip over, but we can understand what does that really mean for me today. Let's go first. Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus is on a cross, nailed, suffering in pain. He's, being put there, he's been put there by humans. Yes, it's part of God's plan. It doesn't change the pain and the agony that he's walking through. People that, that he loves and wants to save are literally killing him. And he says these words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the place of deepest despair, the first thing Jesus wants to make sure we know is he offers forgiveness. And I don't want to talk to you today about offense you might have towards someone else, though we, we pray that, that you will learn and, and walk in God's freedom for that. I don't want to talk about unforgiveness towards someone else. I want to tell you today that this first statement he makes is so profound to me because still today, People have been coming to church, have been following Jesus for years, sometimes decades, and there's, there's 90% of them that is good to go, and yet there's 10% of them that still says, I just feel this, this shame, I just feel this unforgiveness, I wonder would God truly forgive me? And even often we don't utter these words out of our mouths because we would even think it sounds silly or sounds dumb, and we don't even sometimes know what it is. We just have this feeling and Jesus goes, understand, even those who were literally murdering me, I'm the God who declares when you put your faith in me, forgiveness comes, freedom comes. It changes everything. It changes everything. I live so different when I know God's forgiven me. Just had a time we're walking through with one of my kids who understood that God forgave him when he became a follower of Jesus Christ. But then the hard part became I made another mistake. And isn't it so like us as humans? We because we think we're awesome. Like, we're going to get to a spot where we don't make mistakes. And please know that's never going to happen. And he felt so bad because it's like, I know God forgives me from, I know God forgave me for my sins, but then I did this. I said, He still forgives you. Faith in Jesus, and it is, it's from your heart. You can run from God but he'll never run from you. Faith in Jesus and staying in that place doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we keep following him and our sins are forgiven. It's where there's freedom. Know, know today you're not rejected by God. Jesus, and, and from his soul, understand this pain that none of us can imagine. He's like, they've got to know I forgive them. Then he goes again, verse 43. If you don't know the story, Jesus is hung between two other criminals who are both also being crucified, three crosses, three guys dying deaths that we can't fathom in a way they would be um, killed today. And, and one guy that is on Jesus' side, one of the other criminals, decides to put his faith in Jesus. And then in verse 43, Jesus says this, I assure you, Today you will be with me in paradise. And this again is where if we're honest as humans, it becomes really hard for us to understand Christianity and being a follower of Jesus. Because maybe you're here and you're like, I've been trying and doing my best to follow Jesus for years or for decades, and then this guy, this loser, just done whatever he wanted his entire life, basically just said no to God in all of his goodness. Then right before he dies, he decides to put his faith in Jesus, and Jesus says, you'll be with me for eternity. See, this is why God's grace and forgiveness is absolutely scandalous. It is absolutely scandalous. It does not make sense. And it's not supposed to. 
His grace and forgiveness is not supposed to make sense to our natural mind because it is not a natural thing. Is greater. His love is greater. His forgiveness is greater. And in the depths of our Savior's soul, he wants us to know that. You're not rejected. You've been invited. Like you, you, he, he tells that thief, you have the invitation. You're coming with me. Like, you, do you know what it, it feels like to be left out? Some of you are like, I don't want to raise my hand because I don't want to admit that I've ever felt left out. That probably just means that you don't have feelings. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's sometimes in our life, it starts when we're young and we can start to feel that way. Everybody else got invited to the party, but I didn't. Everybody else got invited to that wedding, but I didn't. Every, everybody, you know it's always everybody else? Everybody else but me. In the whole world is doing something. It's me. I'm the only person. This is what Jesus speaks to on the cross. You've not been left out. When he tells that thief, you'll be with me in paradise, he's making sure we know in the midst of navigating this life on the earth, a promise has been made by our Savior on the cross that there's never a moment you're the odd one out. You're always included in the eternal plan of Jesus, and that plan starts now. It's, it's an assurance we get to live with in our heart. It's a faith we get to live with in our heart. Third statement, John chapter 19. It says, Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, which if you're new to Bible, I don't want to just skip over this moment. John was written by this guy named John, and he knew so much that God loved him that he referred to himself as the one God loved. It's not an arrogance, but if we were to say it today, he would literally just be like, hey, just so y'all know, I'm the dude God loves. And I think what a hope and a confidence to live our life that way. It backtracks really to the forgiveness where he had an a level, right? Not even the fullness because Jesus hadn't uh, gone to the cross when he first began to talk in this way. But it says this, he saw his mom and his disciples whom he, and a disciple he loved standing nearby. He said, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her in to his home. In the moment of Jesus' greatest distress, he goes, I want to make sure it's clear that I care about the details of human relationship. He's, Jesus is our Savior. He's going to go to a cross. He's going to die for our, for our sins, for the sins of humanity, that all who would believe in him would have life now and life forever. He's going to rise from the, from the grave, from the tomb, and in a few days he's going to go sit in heaven where he is praying for us right now, the Bible says. And yet in the midst of all that, while he's on the cross, he's like, I want to make sure that the, these humans that are going to be left here, that they take care of each other, that they know they're loved, that they're set up for success. It, it, in the depths of our Savior's soul, he cares about the details of our humanity, the details of our human relationships. This is why we can talk to him. This is why when we read our Bible or when we, we hear about the truths of who he is, we can understand he is a God who wants to relate to us personally. Fourth statement, I believe. Matthew 27, about three o'clock. Jesus called out with a loud voice, my God, my God. It means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I want us, if you could just focus in on me right now. There is no greater despair that can be known to humanity than the feeling of abandonment by God. It's the greatest darkness, it's the greatest pain, it's the greatest tragedy. And Jesus, for us, took that so that you and I would never have to be 
abandoned by him. That we would never have, never have to feel and know the ultimate separation. But now, as a follower of Jesus Christ and forever, I would know his presence. Even in the midst of what could be some of the most difficult and trying of times, I would know his presence in, in the depths of my soul. Sometimes not when I'm like, it feels real good, but I know he's not abandoned me. Jesus loves you and me that much. John 19, fifth statement, Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, complete, then said, I'm thirsty. This is part of why it's so fascinating to study Jesus and what he did because, again, he starts to do things that in our natural way of thinking may not make sense. But one of the reasons that we can trust and believe in the scriptures, that God's word, the Bible, is true, one of the reasons that that his grace and forgiveness is so scandalous, one of the reasons it may not make sense uh, to so many people, but we can still trust it, is because no other religion, which is ultimately a false religion out there, no other way of thinking out there, has record where what is called prophecy, meaning declared things that would happen, that thousands of years later were fulfilled in detail by Jesus. That's what he's doing right here in this moment. Just as was said he would do in a simple statement, he does, sixth statement, John 19, verse 30, Jesus, when he had received the sour wine, said, it is finished. He bowed his head and voluntarily gave up his spirit. Now here's what's really cool. In the original language, it is finished means I won. It's the cry of a winner. The battle's, been, the battle's over. We have triumphed. In fact, uh, the root of the Greek word that is used for this saying one Greek word, and some of you, I just want you to, because there's things, listen, there's things that in the natural sometimes we can't necessarily relate to. I want you to just get the power of this word and, and in practical, understand how much greater it was for Jesus. In, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the root of the Greek word, it signi signifies this, paying off a debt. So I'm like, some of you are like, it felt so good to stay here with me when I paid off my credit card. It felt so good when I paid off my car. It felt so good when I paid off my house. It felt so good when I paid off my, my student loan. Whatever it is when you've like, and you're like, whew, you felt this like, that sense of relief, whatever it might be. Jesus, for all of humanity, goes, I paid it off, we're all done completely, the debt has been fully paid, now there's victory, we never have to worry about it again. Think about that weight where he's like, I've taken it, so you don't have to. Like there's nothing better, there's nothing better. And he's like, I want you to know that. I want you to know that. I want you to know one word. It changed everything. Victory. It changed everything. It changed everything. I don't know, maybe that's the one word you need to hear today. Maybe I could encourage you for just a moment. Maybe God's got a word in you to give to somebody else. It's one word and it'll change everything. It's the power he shows us. With just one word. I'm changed. Seventh statement, Luke chapter 23. By now it was noon. The whole earth became dark. The darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. And he breathed his last. Now I don't want this to sound cliche. But have you placed your life and your trust in Jesus? I don't mean, have you 
came to church, read some Christian self-inspiration books, and tried to stop cussing. You know what I'm saying. We're like, well, this is what a Christian does. No, I mean like here. Have you said, I trust God. I really trust him. I really trust him that his plan is the right plan. I really trust him that he's not forgotten me. I really trust him that his plan is the best. Psalm 103, the psalmist writes it, and, and we, we have this, this story that we've just bookended, if you will, today of, of Holy Week. And the reason I wanted to even kind of do that and, and end here with Psalm 103 is because we can know these truths about Jesus. We can know the steps he asks us to take. But sometimes we still have to will ourselves to trust him and to praise him. See, Psalm 103, the psalmist is feeling this and he says, praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Some translations say bless. And the psalmist, he, he doesn't know the story of Jesus yet, but he knows and has this relationship with God. He knows how good he is, and yet, he just doesn't feel like it. So, so today, you might be a follower of Jesus, and you might be tracking with me on celebrating Jesus and what he's done, and you're like, but inside, sometimes I still just like, I just, I just, don't feel it, pastor. And that's when we start to talk to ourselves and go praise, praise the Lord. I'm gonna bless, I'm gonna bless the Lord. I'm gonna be driving in my car and I'm gonna be the crazy one. I'm gonna drive with my knees so I can raise my hands and worship. <laughs> yeah, I do that sometimes. It freaks my kids out. For all of our officers in the room, I'm sorry. <laughs> praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is who we praise. It's who we praise. It's who we praise. Those things were bought on the cross. I decided last, end of last service, I think I'm gonna do a message series called Benefit Package. Because you know what? I just shared with you the greatest benefit package you can ever be given. And how often, how often are we searching for someone else or for some other company to give us a benefit package that is great when Jesus goes, what I have is the best benefit package you could ever have. My hope is today, we'd say yes to that. Yeah. And that this week as we reflect and grow, that we would be those crazy inviters and bringers to bring people into that life God has for them. Would you close your eyes with me? I'm just gonna lead us in a prayer just like, really like we've shared today. And, and it's, it's a prayer to, to just for you and I to know from the depths of your heart, you've put all your trust in Jesus. Because I will tell you, and some of you I know your story. Most of you I don't. But here's what I know. God is good. And he loves you. Yeah. And he cares about you. Yes, Lord. And when you put your trust in him, it changes everything. Yes. So if you want to put your trust in him, maybe just remind yourself of how good he is. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. today. I've decided my life is in your hands. I trust you completely with my future. In Jesus' name, amen.